Hello, today we're going to be in Luke chapter 8. Luke 8 combines a series of accounts that are expanded in the other synoptic gospels. The first thing we're going to come to is that apparently Jesus had to leave the area of Judea and he's taking a tour of the villages of Galilee. Now I think that's significant for this. Jesus wants everyone to hear the good news. So he's going to go from village to village because some people are not going to be able to come to him. And so here we have Jesus on a mission tour of the entire area of the Galilee. Now the next section is the parable of the sower. Now that is an extremely important parable. It is almost the parable that sets the stage for understanding the other parables. It is duplicated in Mark 13, excuse me, Matthew 13 and Mark 4. It seems to be a little fuller account there. Now this parable is going to cause us some problems because of our preconceived notions about security of the believer. Now I've done a tape on this called the security of the believer versus the perseverance of the saints. We must not come to the Bible with preconceived notions. We must allow the Bible to speak to us. Now the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils is going to say a word to us that we are not going to want to hear. But you see, if the plain sense of this goes against some of our traditional theology. Now I think the, the, Jesus told the disciples this for two reasons. Number one, he wanted them to understand that it is the heart of the receiver that conditions the harvest. The good news is the good news wherever it's proclaimed. But some are going to receive and some are going to reject. And it is the spiritual ears, the spiritual understanding of the one who hears the good news that determines the response. Maybe Jesus told them this to prepare them that some were not going to respond to the message. I've always been amazed about that. A God's powerful message imparted by the Holy Spirit, and yet some are going to reject it. Let's look at the text, if we could, please. Soon afterwards, he chanced to be making a tour of Galilee from town to town and from village to village, preaching and telling the good news. This is the word euangelon. We get the word evangelical or evangelism from it. It's usually translated gospel, but it means good news, of the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God was the subject of Jesus' first sermon and last sermon. It's the subject of almost every parable the kingdom of God is likened to. Now what we have here is a comparison of something in the world to a spiritual truth. Now these are going to be a series of parables. Now parable is a word that means to lay something alongside. We're going to take a common occurrence of life and lay that alongside a spiritual truth to try to convey the meaning of the spiritual truth. Now there is some controversy or ambiguity over the why or the purpose of parables. It seems that to some, parables veil the truth, that they can't understand what the spiritual truth is. But to others, it clearly reveals the truth. Now, I think the parable of the sower is very important in understanding that. To those who have spiritual ears, to those who have been called by God, a parable will illumine. To those who have a dark heart, those who have chosen to reject, parables are going to veil or hide truth. And it depends on the heart of the person. Now, let's look then, it says, by the way, the kingdom of God is a phrase that means the reign of God now in men's hearts that will one day be consummated over all the earth. Jesus said the kingdom of God is near to you. It's in your mouth. It's also a future thing at the second coming. When Jesus prayed in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he was praying for the kingdom of God to come in fullness. We think of it as the second coming, okay? Now, it says the twelve went with him. Now remember that it is my personal opinion that the twelve disciples were not always with Jesus. I think some of them went back to take care of their own families uh, from time to time. Here we have all of the apostolic group with him. Uh, I think the reason it's 12 is because it corresponds to the 12 tribes of Israel. The word 12 seems to be a biblical symbol uh, for the people of God, okay? Now, notice where it continues then. The 12 went with him and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who is called Mary of Magdala, out of whom seven demons have gone. 
Now, I have dealt with the subject of demon uh, possession extensively. We have a brand new catalog out that has six tapes on demon possession their possession of unbelievers, their relation to new believers, their relation to children. I have written a lot of study on this. Uh, I really don't want to do a lot of study on this, but I think it's something we need to see, the New Testament perspective. Notice the word plural here. There are seven demons here. The Gadarene demoniac had hundreds. Uh, quite often there's, there's a plural. Now, I don't understand all that, but simply to say, uh, that somehow more than one of these evil fallen personalities is able to consume and direct the life of human beings. I hope you'll send for the, the catalog where the tapes will be made available to you. It's an important subject and the bibliography you choose will often determine your views. So be careful. The New Testament is the only ground for faith and practice. Now, there is a lady in verse 3 named Joanne. She is mentioned again in chapter 2410, but never again in the Bible. It says the wife of Kurza, uh, Herod's household managers, and some try to relate her to other places in the New Testament, but we're just not certain. Then it has Susanna, and there's no other mention of her anywhere in the Gospels. And many other women who continue to contribute to the needs of... Uh, uh, contribute to their personal needs. Now apparently these women, many of them were widows or had money, and these women supported the apostolic ban. This is the first missionary, uh, woman's missionary union if you please, and these women were very helpful in supplying the needs of the apostolic group. Now, notice if you would where it, um, by the way this was a common practice, for the rabbis uh, utilize the same source of resources. Now, now, as a great crowd was coming together and people were coming to him from one town after another, he said, by the way of a story. Now, I want you to picture the crowd that's following Jesus. There are those who are sick, those who are, who are, are uh, lame, those who are blind, those who are demon-possessed, those who are curious, those who are sincere followers. There's the religious leaders trying to catch him. Oh, there was every conceivable motive in that crowd following Jesus. And Jesus told them this story. I think the fullest account of this is in Matthew 13, 1 through 23. And the reason this story is so pivotal is because Jesus interprets it, which gives us a pattern for interpreting other parables. And you've got to be real careful of how you interpret parables. There's only one central meaning to a parable. We cannot push the details. And those are just two of, of several. Now, a sower went out to sow his seed. Now the sower, they carried loose robes with a belt, and that little pouch that was formed when, when you pulled your robe up is where it's called the bosom. That's where the seed was kept, or in a bag that hung over the shoulder, and they would sow it like this, all across the field. Now in those fields, there would be footpaths where people normally walked on. There would be areas where weeds had grown up. Uh, there would be areas where there were big rocks in the field, but the farmer would plow over that, and so none of that would show. It looked like, a, like a, a newly plowed field. So he would sow the seed across all those different kind of terrains. But several things would happen. Where the people walked, they would continue to walk, and very soon there'd be that hard dirt back in there. Some of the seed fell on that very hard dirt. Uh, there would be patches where the roots of the weeds were already established, and those roots would grow up very f much faster because they were established root system. The other ones were very soil that was shallow. Now you couldn't see it, but underneath there was a rocky ledge or a large boulder, and the, the root, the tap root, could not go down and get moisture, and the heat of the sun would kill it. Now this is the illustration, this common illustration that everyone understood and understand about the, the agricultural techniques. Jesus is using this to show the good news of the gospel falling on men's hearts. Now, let's see. Okay. In verse 8 it says, And another portion of the field, rich soil, and grew and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. Now, Matthew and Mark both mention 30, 60, and 100. What Jesus is saying is there's going to be different crowds that more will respond in one crowd than another. The gospel is the same. Nothing changes about it. It's the, the heart of the hearer. There had not been a resurrection. The gospel was not complete. So all they could say was, here's a great healer. Here's a great teacher. He said, now don't tell that because he had enough problem with these crowds wanting healing. He says, don't tell them yet. There will come a time when the proclamation of who he is fully, son of God, dying for men's sins, raised from the dead, trust him by faith, and you can be part of the family of God, will be complete. But this messianic secret is part 
of these first two Gospels. Well, I've really enjoyed being with you.